Okay, welcome to another show of the Research to Reps Roundtable. I am your co-host, Pat Ivey, and with me is Dr. Ted Lambranitis. How you doing, Ted? I'm doing great, Pat. Nice to be here today. Oh, I'm yes, great to, to see you. I'm good great. to go today. Good to go because you were at the <laughs> NFL nice. Combine and you just couldn't get out of those meetings. They seem to they want Dr. Ted involved. And we also have here Dr. Ernie Reimer. How's it going, Hey, I'm doing good. I'm just reading this really cool book called Good to Go uh -huh. by Christy Ashwanden. And, and right here in the opening page, it says, train hard and then take a nap and get a good night's sleep. So Christy, would you tell us what inspired you to write this book to begin with and maybe what the key findings of the book were? Sure, sure. I'd be happy to. Uh, Good to Go is the book that I wish I had had. I wish I had read when I was, I don't know, maybe a high school athlete would have been a good time to read it, but college would have been okay as well. Um, so a little bit of background on, on myself. Um, I started off as a runner in high school and college. Um, and then in college, I had an injury. And so I started uh, cycling and cross-country skiing while I was working through this knee injury that was preventing me from running. Um, and I ended up competing at all three of those sports at a pretty elite level. Um, after college, I was a bike racer for a while, but then I went on to uh, travel around the world, racing and competing as a Nordic skier. I did that all over, all over Europe. And so that's kind of the, the sport that I probably did the most seriously. And during that time, I really, I was basically training my butt off, which is what I think most athletes do. And I really had this mindset that's very popular, particularly among endurance athletes, that more is better and you need to train, train, train. And I wish that it hadn't taken me, you know, my whole, whole career to realize that that's not the best way and that actually um, more isn't always better. And so recovery is the one aspect I think that I never really um, was able to get right until maybe the, the end of my career. You know, I figured it out eventually, you know, you, you learn when you make mistakes, that's a really good way to learn things, but good to go. It was my chance to sort of put this all in a book and talk about what is recovery? Why is it so important and how can we focus on it? And I think one of the big takeaways of the book is that recovery is very individual. It's not something that can be completely prescribed. Um, this is going to sound a little bit counterintuitive, but the most important skill that any athlete can learn is the ability to read their own bodies and to read their body's cues because recovery is very individual. You can have two people on the same team going to the same training camp, doing all the same things. One person may absorb that training better, or one person may need more, more recovery from that training than the other. So you can't just look around and see what your training partner or your competition is doing, you really need to learn to not only read your own body, but to trust it. And I think that takes a lot of effort and a long time for a lot of athletes. And so this is something I talk about a lot in the book is how do you learn to read your own body? What are the signs of recovery? How do you know if you're recovered or not? And you know, the reason that recovery is so important is that's the time when your body is actually making the gains. You know, you don't get stronger that moment that you're in the, the gym doing, you know, a weightlifting exercise, you know, that, that particular squat or bench doesn't pop your muscles and make it bigger. That stuff happens while you're resting and recovering from those efforts. And so it's really fundamentally important that you get this part of the process correct and that you give, you know, your body, the resources that you need to achieve that recovery. Yeah. So. I was, as I was listening to you, Christy, when you said recovery is individualized, my background being a strength and conditioning coach, yeah. we, we under, we did, we tried to individualize it, but it was more from a psychological standpoint, meaning if you choose to do it, then you're more likely to do it, but not really mm -hmm. from the physiological standpoint, although they're connected. Yeah. So giving someone the, so, so you have to educate people, right? You have to educate athletes yeah. so they know, or, or are you saying that as the practitioners, we need to know what each individual athlete needs, or are you saying more, we need to educate each individual athlete on what they need, and then they choose what they need to do? 
Right. I would say it's both actually. So a really good athlete, and this is something I'm sure you've all seen this among elite athletes, those high performing athletes have really learned to read their bodies like this. Um, but as a coach, as a practitioner, you know, the, the really great coaches are able to read this in their athletes too, and really take, take note of and, and observe when their athletes are responding well to training, when they're not. You know, a great coach will be able to say, look, I can see that this athlete is tired right now and this extra training is actually harming them. It's not helping. It's not doing what it needs to do. Yeah, meanwhile, there may be another person on that team who needs actually a little bit more because they're absorbing the training, but they, they could take a little bit more to have more of an adaptation. So I think, you know, we all want the magic bullet, the thing that, you know, the number you can read on a sports watch or the, you know, the metric that you can use to tell you that this individual athlete is recovered, but we don't have that. I mean, I, I can assure you that we don't have that because I spent almost two years working on this book, interviewing, you know, hundreds of athletes, of uh, practitioners, of coaches, but also scientists, researchers who are studying all of this scientifically. And there's a lot of companies now that are chasing this. And I don't think anyone's perfected it in terms of having, you know, this metric that will tell you, yes, you're recovered or no, you're not. It's really all of the stuff going together. And that makes it tricky. You know, it's, it's kind of the basics. It's how does the athlete feel? How are they sleeping? All of these things go into it. It's kind of interesting. The very best uh, metric that does track with recovery is actually mood. And I think, you know, if, if you're someone who's worked with athletes, you've seen this, right? You know, towards the end of a training camp, everyone's cranky and moody because they're tired. And that really tracks. I had one coach that I interviewed for the book who said, sometimes he'll actually ask his athletes, roommates or spouse, you know, how's his mood? And that's a good way of knowing, you know, is, is this athlete becoming a little overtrained? Because when you're tired, you know, you get, you get moody and that's individual. You know, some people make it really cranky. Some may get depressed. Um, sometimes people get a little manic, you know, it's individual. Have you had, a, have any of you noticed this among your athletes? Oh, yes. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Here's a question I have for you, Christy, is with regard to that, let's just say you had, uh, you know, athletes, same sport, mm -hmm. but they have really positive reinforcement coaches mm -hmm. versus having somebody that's negative and very critical you know, that in itself could affect somebody's mood and, you know, perhaps absolutely. the recovery. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And, and I think one very underappreciated aspect of recovery is that, you know, to your body, any kind of stress is stress on it. And so anything that's going on that's stressing the body will, you know, decrease the body's ability to absorb training, uh, to recover from the training. And so this is why if you're coaching college athletes, you know, you need to back down their training during finals because they're stressed and they're probably not sleeping as well because they're up late studying things like that. And so it's really crucial that you recognize those other stressors on the body. This is also why it's really, really important for every athlete to come up with a really good uh, stress management strategy. And you'll notice that I don't say stress elimination. You can't eliminate stress. We all have stresses in our lives. So I think the key is, is identifying them and planning for them and figuring out ways to cope. So, you know, it means that week of finals, maybe you, you take extra rest days, maybe, maybe you reduce the training by half and that's to give the body, you know, that extra umph and those extra resources that it needs to recover from those things so that you can bounce back and, and do the training, but you can't just be piling it all on top of one another. And I think there's this tendency to say, well, you know, you didn't do anything yesterday because you were taking finals all day. Well, your body was under a lot of stress and that wasn't really a, a rest day when it comes to body's physiology. Yeah. Dr. Reimer, as a, as a sports scientist, the word recovery what is it? You know, because I, I have, I've had athletes that said they don't want to feel that good. Like they don't want to feel um, what, what a one hour massage can give them. They didn't want to feel, they didn't want to feel that they thought they would be, they were a better performer when they didn't feel as good. So what is recovery? Like, how can you, can you make sense of, of what I, the example I just gave and, and while defining what 
what is happening in your body? Or what do we want to happen in our bodies? What is how what is that process? Well, for me, I guess in the same way that I've had to define sports science over the last 10 years or so, defining recovery is really important. So what do we want to happen? I would say we want adaptation, which would be a physiological response to repeated exercise exposure or other types of exposure. But recovery would be a return to a normal state of health, mind, and strength, so to speak. And when I educate athletes on this topic, these are the definitions I use for recovery and adaptation and understanding that recovery facilitates the adaptive process. I would probably go a little bit further in trying to understand it more. The way, the way we've tried to conceptualize this would be that sometimes it's recovery may just be um, readiness or preparation for activity. We, we lump it all as recovery, but sometimes you wake up, you're not in a good mood. Maybe you're lacking motivation. Your body feels like crap. Maybe you lacked some sleep last night. I think as a industry in sports, a lot of times our immediate response would be, oh, Ernie is not in a good mood today and his, his body's sore, so maybe we should reduce training load today. When I actually think it's possible to listen to those signals and maybe develop different routines, readiness routines to prepare to be more productive in training today, with the, like instead of just throwing the training out. On the other end, I might propose that after training, after physical activity, under the recovery umbrella, we might refer to that as recharge. We got that word from just, just working with some psychologists in the past. And sometimes when you say recovery, that implies that something's wrong. Because in a lot of settings, when you say recovering from something, there, there implies that something bad happened, but, but training isn't a bad thing. It, or, you know, practice isn't a bad thing. It's a good thing. So this idea of recharging your batteries, recharging your energy stores. And so, so I've started to also educate athletes on like, what are your recharge routines? It depends. Like Christy said, it depends on listening to your body. If you're not in the best mental state or mood state, that's a different recharge routine than if you're not in the best physical state. Quite frankly, if you feel great, both in mind and body, and you had an easy training, maybe you don't need any recovery or mm -hmm. recharge at all, but maybe tomorrow morning, you might need some readiness depending on what happens between now and then. So I, I might throw this over at Dr. Ted and just from your experience, Ted, in consulting with all of the NFL teams and other universities and other pro sport and elite sport groups, like how do they talk about recovery and, you know, how, how do they approach it? on an individual level with athletes? I think they, they look at it as the four re's and that's rehydrate, re refuel, rebuild, and recharge. When they term recharge, it's more the mental aspect. Uh, in fact, I was just, uh, I just visited three NFL teams in the last five days and the hundreds of thousands of dollars they're spending on so-called recovery rooms is amazing. Uh, you know, when they're trying to address and have as many different modalities, you know, for their players, um, you know, it's possible trying to address that arm because if they don't provide it, the athletes are going to be doing it in their own communities anywhere or at some other facility and they'd rather have control over, you know, that process. And I think monitoring to a certain degree. And, but I think Christy's one point in terms of the individuality yeah. of it. And I think that goes to, uh, you, you always think about the heritage studies that looked at, you know, the different genomes that control training adaptation and yeah. her, she was dead on. And that is, you can put a group of 20 people on a, say an anaerobic conditioning test and you'll have high and low responders. And, and I would imagine her points dead on in terms of tracking recovery, you'll have perhaps high and low responders as well. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And the other thing that's really interesting is just that individual responses um, is really interesting. I, 
I interviewed at length uh, a coach, uh, actress, exercise physiologist who actually works for the uh, USOC who had been working with gymnasts. This was a while back, um, but he was tra tracking their recovery and trying to find, really trying to figure out, okay, what can I look at here to know when they need more rest because they're training really hard. And what he found is there was no universal thing, but at the same time, each individual athlete had his or her own individual thing. So it wasn't that, you know, for every single athlete, you know, an elevated morning heart rate or a particular kind of soreness in the leg or a kind of headache or sore throat or whatever the thing was the thing, but for each individual, they would have that thing. And so for me personally, I know that I am under recovered when I wake up in the morning and I have this particular kind of kind of scratchy throat, the kind of thing where it's like, am I sick? I'm not sure, but it's just this, and it's a very subjective feeling, but it's very distinct. And I've learned that this is, this is what it feels like for me individually to be a little overextended. And I know that if I wake up feeling like that and I take it easy that day, maybe I train, but I just train a little, but you know, I'm not gonna be doing a really hard or intense workout that day. I can do that and then I'll be fine in a day or two. If I ignore that and say, no, no, I'm fine. I'm gonna do that interval workout I had planned, you know, it's on my schedule that's when all of a sudden I'm sick or I'm injured or I'm just in the hole, you know? And the thing about being overtrained is once you step over the line, you can't just step back. Then you have to go all the way back to the beginning of the queue, you know, because you can't go from overtrained to fit, you know, from overtrained, you can only go back to like not ready and you have to take that time. So it really behooves an athlete to be careful not to step over that line. Um, Pat, have you experienced this with some of your athletes? Yes. And, and um, they think that you can just hit the reset button. Yeah. <laughs> and it happens. And then I'm, I'm good. I hit the reset button. Uh, well, I went home and took a nap and I'm all good now. But what you just said, you don't just go back to being good. You have to, if you worked to that continuum of being overtrained, over, overreached, overtrained, then you have to go, you have to work your way back down. So that's, that's interesting to me. I, I can think of athletes that they would buy into recovery only to do more work. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> they'll do the stretching, they'll do the yoga, whatever they'll, they'll do the cryotherapy mm -hmm. only to be able to come in and do extra. Yeah. And, um, you know, there, there's a lot of components to that. Um, you know, some believe that they have to do more to compete. Mm -hmm. Some believe that um, some have goals, dreams, and aspirations and believe that the best do A, B, and C. Yeah. And they watch, watch some one of, one of their favorite athletes on YouTube. And so you have to constantly educate and give them opportunities and, and be in touch with them and teach them how to be in, in tune with themselves, like you said, I, I really like the way you led off. And recovery is individualized. Yeah. Yeah, you really hit on something that I think is important. I, I think this has become a lot more difficult now in this age of social media and where everyone is always sharing all the time what they're doing. And of course, you know, we all know that things that people share are just one view of things, right? You don't, you don't show that you're feeling terrible, you show yourself smiling and all that. Um, but there's almost, you know, among elite athletes, there's an obligation to, first of all, show all these products and things that are sponsoring you that may be completely worthless, but they're giving you money. So you're, you're showing, you know, that they're being used. And so it creates this atmosphere where everyone thinks you have to do all of these things all the time. And there's this real FOMO, you know, and this idea that if other people are doing this training, I need to do it now too. And I think you know, I think it's really important to shift that mindset. And I think a much more fruitful and healthy mindset is to say, okay, what does my body need? My, you know, if I'm an athlete and I'm competing at any kind of high level, that means that I have some special genetics, right? Like I, I have a gift. How can I best use that gift? And what are the ways that that I am, you know, individually programmed in order to perform? And that's not going to be the same as, as someone else. And so really, I think one sign of a mature athlete and a, of an elite athlete is someone who has confidence, confidence in their own judgment. I mean, 
any any jerk can train harder. It takes a real hero, right, to say, no, I'm going to take a rest day and to have that confidence and say, no, I know what's right for my body. I'm, I'm going to, you know, do a little bit less. And I think the proper mindset should not be, how can I train the maximum amount possible? I think the proper mindset is to say, what are the endpoints that I want? What are the adaptations I want from training? And what is the sort of minimum effective dose that I can do to get that? You know, training more to get the same training effect isn't helping you. It's increasing your risk of injury. You know, it's going to take more time. It's going to steal, you know, energy away from your body's ability to recover. But unless that's, that's spawning extra adaptations, it's really not helping you. And so instead of trying to do more, what athletes should really be doing is saying, what is the minimum amount I can do to stay healthy, to be fit, to get to that fitness, you know, so that I don't cross that line because that line, that line to overtraining is such a danger zone that it's really, it's always a hundred times better to be just a tiny bit undertrained because it, as soon as you're 2% overtrained, you're done, right? We were talking about that earlier. You're back to the end of the line. You, don't, you can't go from overtrained to fit. So I think it's really good to have you know, a very healthy fear of that overtrained line. Yes, and knowing what that is, knowing, yeah. being educated on what overtrained is and, and the yeah. downfalls of that. In, in sickness and all the other things that go along yeah. with that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I'm, I'm curious, Ted, is this something that you found among the athletes that you work with, kind of this, this sense of, of knowing what's the right dose for them? You know, I, I think uh, I've gotten that actually, uh, I met with a couple head coaches in the last week and the, you know, some of their star players, you know, how do I manage the, you know, the workloads? Cause this yeah. guy wants to practice, but I, you know, I, I want to make sure that uh, they can get through a 17 game season effectively. And it's, they're always looking at, I want to keep the athlete fresh, but I also want to make sure that tactically schematically we're executing at high level. So what's the trade-off? What's that to your point? What's the minimal effective dose where we can maximize recovery and enhance performance at the same time? And I think it's, I don't think it's a science, it's an art. Mm -hmm. And um, so, uh, you know, I think for the, the coaches, it's the communication with the player, like, you know, how do you feel? Mm -hmm. And because uh, for a set, you know, you sit there and you go, this, particular workload for player a he may have the resiliency to tolerate it player b may not yeah and so we have to try to figure out how do we identify that and make corrections that doesn't make the practice schedule for today you know all out of, all out of kilter yeah because if, if i'm if i'm sitting or reducing the workload for player a now there's other players in that position group their workload goes up yeah, you know, yeah right. usually so it's a it's it's a juggling act and um but it's that's i think the fun part of you know helping teams is you know trying to help them juggle that uh that performance recovery uh continuum yeah definitely and i think there's also something to you know leaving the athlete a little bit hungry you want them to show up on game day or race day really rearing to go and not not exhausted and not just trying to stay afloat right and I think you know having you know sort of helping them to save it for those high performances this is particularly true in the season you know I think in preseason you really then you want to do some overload training and and things are different but during the season you really want to keep those hard efforts for the competitions and you want to keep them you know at that point too I think one thing, um, yeah, there's physical recovery, but there's also the psychological aspect of it and helping, helping the athlete really feel ready regardless of how things have gone or whatever, because just feeling that confidence can go a huge way to how they will actually feel and, and whether they're going to perform at their best. Yeah. Um, Ernie, is this something you, yeah. Yeah, I, I think a lot of times too, is, you know, some teams, some players will, you know, track their HRV mm -hmm. and, and, 
inevitably what you'll find is, is what happens once they come to the pr practice facilities, not the issue. <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah. it's their personal life that right. creates that creates the havoc. And mm -hmm. sometimes it's having them uh, adjust to handling, you know, their daily functions as a professional athlete as they transition from college. And, you know, that's, uh, you've got, you know, 20 people asking for loans. Yeah. And that's, that's, uh, in your, to your point, there's all sorts of stress and that's a real stress for a lot of athletes. And I'm sure Pat's all firsthand as a, as a pro uh, football player. Yeah, I, I did. And I'm reminded of a story, you know, as a coach of an athlete who's an NFL player today. And we were using the Omega Wave. And I know I've shared this story before. Um, we had a few athletes that we wanted to um, test the day after the game. So it would be a Sunday. We played on Saturday. And he came in, and he was red on Sunday. And, and we, we, we sat him down and said, hey, you're, you're red. He's like, what does that mean? It's like, well, it means whatever you did after the game until – you showed up here in the weight room really hurt your ability to be ready for practice on Tuesday and Wednesday. He's like, you all can tell that <laughs> like, <laughs> yes, I don't know what you did and I'm not going to ask you what you did, but I'm just telling you compare it to your other teammates. Uh, whatever you did, you did it. And he said, That'll never happen again. <laughs> okay. And he was yellow for the rest of the season, sometimes even green on a Sunday after a game. Maybe today I can ask him, hey, <laughs> what I kind of want to know. <laughs> <laughs> what what did you do? Do you remember that? <laughs> um, but I, I do know that he was such a high level athlete I think he was a first round draft pick mm -hmm. he was such a high level athlete and he's a starter in the NFL such a high level athlete that he could he that information was valuable to him we didn't have to say okay tell us exactly what you did what did you do at 11 o'clock what were you doing at midnight what were you doing at one in the morning he is a future professional all you have to do is help him to know that recovery you what you do after a game is is probably more important than what you did during the game and, and your ability to be ready for the next game, which is important to you because you want to have a good season because yeah. future first round draft picks have good seasons. And That's right. that was that it makes me think of him. I wish I could. Uh, I love that story. And, yeah. you know, I just want to say something here about, I think it's really interesting, these metrics, these things we can measure, you know, we, we sort of have a bias in our society towards numbers. Look, I'm a, I'm a data geek, I share this, but we think that something that can be quantified is somehow more reliable or whatever, when in fact, you know, numbers can be incorrect, you can measure wrong or whatever, but I'm going to just speculate my guess is that that athlete probably stayed up really late, didn't get enough sleep, whatever he was doing, it involved, you know, not getting enough sleep, right? And so you could tell him, look, sleep's really, really important, you know, and I can't emphasize enough, you need to get enough sleep every night, or you can do this, you know, I have an anecdote in my book of a track coach, coach who worked with his athletes and was telling them, look, you need to sleep enough, but he started having them track. And then he was tracking their performances and at the end of the season. And I think he did this before the end of the season, he showed them their data, like, look, it tracks your performance in practice tracks lines up perfectly with your sleep patterns. And so it's one thing to know it and say, yeah, yeah, coach. But it's another to have this thing and showing, look for you particularly, like, let me show you how it affects you. And I think that's some, some aspect here where those kinds of data collection things can be really helpful. Not because it's telling something, you know, that we don't already know. I mean, I can tell you the basics of recovery are sleep. It's proper, um, you know, nutrition, but it's mostly, I mean, it's sleep and proper nutrition and reducing stress. I mean, those are sort of the three pillars. 
Um, but people don't like that sounds really simple, yet it's very difficult to get right. And I think the number one step for getting athlete buy-in is getting them to really prioritize those things and to believe that for them, it, it really does apply and that they can have benefits by giving, you know, proper attention to the, those basic things. Everyone wants, you know, the magical thing that they can buy or they can do that's going to make their recovery better. But there's, I can guarantee you, there is no product that you can use or no ritual that you can do in one of these recovery rooms that's going to surpass what you will get out of a good night's sleep. And it's really interesting, you know, just the rise of the recovery stuff is really driven so much by marketing. We have so many products now they're so heavily marketed to athletes, but they also sponsor all the sports and they sponsor all the high level athletes. And so as soon as you have a situation where all the pro athletes are being sponsored by this stuff, and now they're showing themselves on social media, doing this regardless of whether it's helping them or not, it creates this scenario where everyone thinks, well, this is what you have to do. And like everyone in the NFL does this. And it's really interesting while I was researching my book, talking to some exercise physiologists, these are people who are really you know, tracking individuals, athletes, physiology, and looking at how they're responding to things, you know, telling me that one of their number one jobs in working with the really high level professional athletes was just kind of protecting them from all of these ideas that they needed to do this, that, or the other thing, because there's such a huge fear of missing out and this fear that like everyone else has some secret thing or some, you know, thing that's going to make all the difference. Well, the thing that's going to make all the difference is mastering the basics. And like most people don't do that. So it's, it's kind of on the one hand, it's simple. And yet it's not simple because so many people don't get it right. Now, Christy is a, an athlete, you know, you trained hard and you yeah. in tune with your body. Did you compete against an athlete that was really gifted, but they ate awful. They <laughs> didn't follow great recovery, but were just high, uh, you know, they excel at a high level. Is that, did you find that if you did, you know, very frustrating? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's frustrating for every athlete to see someone who's doing something, you know, where you feel like you're having to work harder than the other, the other athletes. I actually have an anecdote in my book about Usain Bolt. Uh, when he was at the Beijing Summer Olympics, he was eating at McDonald's in the sports village every day because he, that was, you know, comfortable, familiar foods for him. You know, we would all call it junk food. The guy won a bunch of gold medals, you know, and I think the answer isn't just like, it doesn't matter what you eat, but I think, you know, it doesn't, the, <laughs> Usain Bolt is not winning gold medals because of what he's eating, right? And these things that we're, that we're doing uh, for recovery and for training and all this, these are ways of optimizing these special talents that athletes have, but none of them individually are going to make the difference. You know, I, I think, I wish athletes could just be convinced to quit looking for, you know, making the differences in these little things that don't matter. I'm not saying diet doesn't matter, but there's not some special food or some special recovery drink or electrolyte or whatever that's going to make the difference in your performance. The important thing is that you're eating pretty well, that you're getting enough calories and whatnot. You know, the important thing is that you're getting enough sleep. It's not that you're, you know, doing something in, in some particular special state. And it's, uh, you know, there, there's just so much, I, I think it's really hard to get away from the marketing because it's so effective and they're so effective at, you know, athletes are some of the most superstitious people you will ever meet. And they're also very, you know, sort of anxious about things. And I think this, this marketing really taps into that anxiety. And there's a sense that you need to be doing absolutely everything you can to perform but what ends up happening is you get into a scenario where people are paying incredible attention and time and effort and energy on things that at their very best might make a very marginal difference, while at the same time, you know, not putting that kind of energy and effort into the things that are really, really important, which is, you know, following the, the training plan that's best for you, getting that sleep, you know, getting proper nutrition and all of that. And so, you know, it's easy to just get sidetracked. Yeah, Christy, and, and I would, I would like to hear what Ernie has to say about this as well. When I was coaching, we spent a lot of time talking about recovery, you know, mm -hmm. foam, foam rollers and massage sticks and the cross balls and the 
everything that was low budget all the way to having massage therapists come in. And we were doing that, hoping that they would get better sleep. Mm -hmm. But we, sleep was almost something we didn't want to talk about. I don't, I don't know why that is. Is it because we didn't have enough knowledge on it? It's almost like we didn't want to, we didn't want to make things worse. Mm -hmm. We didn't want to throw a bunch of ideas out there about sleep. And then all of a sudden someone goes, you know, ever since I tried whatever example or whatever, I haven't been able to sleep at all. And so I think we avoided talking about sleep. We would have athletes say, I have trouble sleeping. And we would go, well, maybe you need to get off of social media at a certain time. We would do some <laughs> of the, you know, some of the basic, yeah. basic things we knew about sleep. But as far as consulting a sleep expert or doing some research on sleep, we didn't go that far. And, and I just look back and wonder why did we not go that far? So I'm curious to know, Ernie, what do you, what have you done with educating athletes on sleep or did you think it was important? And, you know, Ted as well. We, I mean, it, it's such a big topic and it, in a way it, it's kind of the X factor in sport. We do have sleep monitors. Then there's a almost an ethical or a philosophy around should you ask your athletes to use those if they're not asking to use them in a way. In my, my opinion, I, I feel like mandating anyone to wear a sleep monitor would be an invasion of privacy. So, so there's an issue around it, but, but so I'm not sure if that's the, the solution. And that's usually where the question starts is a coach will go, Hey, what about this sleep device where we can track the athlete's sleep? That's usually where it starts. In fact, with a coach here at our institution recently, that's how I got in front of the head coach was because of a sleep device. And so, well, you can spend thousands of dollars on sleep devices. The athletes will get something out of it for a period of time. They'll learn a lot about themselves and they probably won't need the device anymore but we're still going to be paying for it. Or maybe we can just start to embrace some education around this topic. And what I, what I preach it, it, from a recovery standpoint is that the foundation of recovery is your physical fitness. So we, we know from the research that athletes who are stronger, more well-conditioned, they won't experience as much physiological distress muscle damage, et cetera, from physical activity. So if you have high levels of physical, uh, physical fitness, then you will be more resilient to what you do in your normal training and practice and competition activities. And then the pillars that we preach are going to be sleep, nutrition, and I like to say relaxation. And so from a sleep standpoint, that's the X factor because we've got people all over nutrition. We have full-time dietitians. Relaxation, we've got all these people, every discipline, trying to share these recovery modalities that athletes can use. In a way, I think one of the common denominators is that you're just getting off your feet and reducing energy expenditure. So it funnels into relaxation, but there's a mental part of relaxation. That's where the mental health and mental skills practices come into play. But from a sleep standpoint, we don't touch it. But you guys have commented on a few things. You've talked about FOMO. You've talked about mood. You've talked about sleep. I hypothesize that the three are interrelated, maybe in a young adult triad for mental health, because I, I'm not sure what comes first, but when you are using a lot of electronic devices at night and social media is one of those um, influences and you're not getting a lot of sleep, then you have poor mood right? Or did it start with the bad mood that caused you to get less sleep or that caused you to look at social media? I'm not sure what's related there. So we talk about these issues with coaches, this head coach I just mentioned, and he asked me, well, how does, how do my athletes succeed on Sunday after a long day of competition on Saturday? Cause we often will compete two days in a row. I'm like, um, good post-match nutrition, you know, get your mind off things, get a good night's sleep. He's like, well, I want a magic pill. And I'm like, well, the only magic pill I have for you is to create an opportunity for me to start educating your athletes. 
So he's like, cool, come on in. And what came from that is we met as a group and we just talked. And then five athletes on that team reached out individually and said, can we meet individually? Suddenly we, we start to get to that individual level talking about how can you get more sleep? Some athletes are really dialed in, but then others need other things. One particular athlete was a fifth year college, get one more year of eligibility, doesn't live with roommates, lives alone, says, I just like scroll social media all the time. I'm living alone. I'm really lonely. I'm really bored. I'm like, well, what do you do outside of golf and classes? He's like, well, I have low academic load. So it's just golf. I don't, I don't know. I'm bored. I'm like, do you have a hobby? <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, well, I, I like to cook. Why don't you cook for your team or something? He sent me a photo a week later in, in, of a picture of him cooking a meal for his team. Um, because I actually think that what you said earlier about this idea of mood and connectedness to your people, it's, it's, has a little bit of a mental health aspect, but if you feel really connected to everyone around you, you walk in and everyone around you is just like, yeah, like you're on our team. You're part of our squad. You have a better mood when that happens. And if you do some really good self-care and take care of yourself on a well-rounded way, you're going to be in a really good mood. And suddenly training is easier you're more enthusiastic to push yourself in training it, it all just gets easier honestly so from an education standpoint it's like how do you get coaches to embrace all recovery aspects but sleep in general how to manage their team to give their athletes more opportunities to get sleep but then how do you work with the individual athlete even in the college setting to help that athlete learn more about their body 24 hours a day not just during the four hours a day we have the athlete mm -hmm. So that was a little long winded, but I would like to maybe ask you, Dr. Ivy, about this idea of, you know, working in pro sport, working in college sport and, you know, starting to work with athletes in, in almost in a way to give them more autonomy and, and teaching them to be more autonomous about managing their body in a way that that's a big challenge in our setting in college sport. But what, what are your thoughts and reflections on working in pro sport versus like college sport and, and, how, how can we find that? I think you might have more time. Uh, professional athletes may have a little more time. The season is longer, but I think without class, uh, I mean, class and homework take up a lot of time. Class, homework, mentors, community service, uh, all of the different programs that we have them attending, um, I think I think the best professional athletes have already come close to mastering distraction control. Mm -hmm. And so they've eliminated a lot of the things that may cause that external um, stress and, and pressures, the ones that that make it. And, and there are a lot that enter and don't figure it out and then they get weeded out. Uh, but those that make it uh, tend to have these systems that that they're able to put in place to um, allow them to be more efficient. They get the, the, to get the sleep. Um, they have the routines and the the strategies. Um, it's almost like they 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 have a singular focus on, on what it is that they're trying to do, and they don't let anything else. Um, come in in the way of that as far as what the best do college is there are so many distractions um <laughs> there's so many other yeah. other teams in the weight room other teams in the training room the uh professors and there's the community the donors uh internships <laughs> there's so much there's, there's so many more distractions. Um, I don't know if that answered your question or not, but. Yeah, I think where I was going is, is just this idea in maybe stepping away from our contact with an athlete in a day and truly understanding that individual's complete set of demands that they have on them. And when I alluded to the idea of connectedness, like when we're having these interviews with the athletes, the whole thing is like, what do you have on your plate? Like, what do you do? What do you like? And what are you really looking for? Suddenly you find out that some of those athletes aren't actually here for sport first. They're actually here to get an education first. 
Let's play into that. Let's help you be productive there so that you can be more productive in sport. But so, so I think what I was trying to get at is, is if we can step away from that finite amount of time that we have contact with the athlete and try to appreciate how unique every single athlete's just day and their schedule and their set of demands would be, and then help to educate them and help, help maybe refine and give them some advice on how they can manage that better. You have an athlete who has all online classes. Classes are due on Wednesday and Sunday. The athlete prefers to wait until Sunday, but they're competing on Saturday and Sunday. So I'm like, well, if academics are your priority, but you really like to compete, how often do you feel the stress of what's due on Sunday night while you're competing on Saturday and Sunday? A lot. Okay. That time you told me you had in the mornings, four days a week. What if you could get your academics done and by Friday you have everything done on Sunday so you don't have the stress of competition anymore? And if you haven't quite gotten that work done, you'll be even more prepared to get better grades when you turn it in on Sunday because you'll still have that normal time. So, so that's what I was trying to get at, Dr. Ivy, was just this idea of, of trying to understand what those demands are a little bit and starting to educate athletes and their coaches to say, every athlete has a unique set of demands. We need to start educating that athlete to be fully equipped to manage that 24 hours a day. And let me clarify something. I was not saying, and I'm not saying you said that you said, I said this, I was not oh, saying that academics bad. is a distraction. <laughs> I was not saying because, because some people oh. will hear that and, and think that's what I said, that, that is not it. It is, it is about when you are supposed to be a student, like you're in class actually being focused on that when you're supposed to be doing your homework, being focused on that when you're supposed to be in practice, being focused on that and, and putting your all in, into that. That's what I was. And, and, and I'll say, I did not hear that. I was okay. just giving a, a case in point. What I was trying to express is that like, we have our goals. We have the things in our mind that we think are most important because of our own aspirations, what we're being employed or hired to do. But our initiatives, our goals don't always align with what the individual's athlete's set of goals may be. And if we're not taking an opportunity to understand what's important to the individual, maybe we're missing an opportunity to help that athlete feel more connected and confident and in their setting to work with us. And so I wasn't, I didn't take that at all. I was just giving that as a, a unique example of trying to understand the athletes individual needs and goals from their perspective. So let me ask Christy a question. Since you wrote your book, what have you, what else have you been able to learn since then? Because, uh, and, and please don't, don't feel like you can't, you know, talk about what the accomplishments that you've had, please. Uh, don't hold back. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think honestly, one of one of the things I've learned, um, you know, when my book came out, I spent about a year on book tour, you know, giving talks. I mean, here it is several years later, I'm still talking about the book. I get a lot of invitations to do so. Um, but in talking to people and hearing sort of the response to my book, but also just response to, to these conversations about this topic, um, what I found is that, you know, again, the marketing around this stuff is really, really powerful. And one of the sort of frustrations I've had with the book is that there is some resistance to some of the messaging. You know, people say, you know, really uh, common, uh, look, I get every, almost every day, I get wonderful praise about the book. It's really gratifying and wonderful. I get a lot of reader letters. It's wonderful. But there's another side to it. And sometimes, you know, if you go look on Amazon, on, you'll see that one of the top rated comments on the book says this book I'm paraphrasing I haven't looked at this in a long time but it's like this book sucks it just says nothing works just sleep more and it's like yes that's right good you re like you got the message but yeah and so there's this idea that like oh this is disappointing that's not you know I was reading this to find out you know the 10 secrets to perfect recovery and, um, you know, I think the positive message here, you know, that's one way of framing it, that this is negative, that nothing works. 
But I think that it's actually a positive message, which is that you are being marketed at, you're being told that there's all this crap that you need to be doing. There's all these products you need to buy. There are all these things you need to be doing, like the massage tool, the ice baths, the, you know, all of these things that are really not helping except to the extent that they uh, give you an, an opportunity to, I, I really like how you put this earlier, and you know, anything that gets you to reduce your energy expenditure, anything, you know, those things, I call them the squeezy pants, the pneumatic compression devices. I personally love these. They're really, they feel great. They're a great, great way to get yourself to like take 20 or 40 minutes to put your feet up and relax. But let's be clear here. It's the relaxing. It's the time off your feet. It's the actual relaxation. That's the benefit here. And the, the, you know, that's really what recovery is. It's relaxing. It's recharging. It's all of those things. And so you don't need, I think that the pop positive message here is that you don't need to worry about all this stuff. There's a lot of stuff that right now you have anxiety and worry about, you have FOMO about, and that's just misplaced. Like stop chasing these marginal gains of the newest, latest, shiniest, most expensive new toy that everyone's getting. Those things are just a distraction. And I think, you know, athletes who can really take this to heart and say, I'm going to choose to spend my energy and my attention on the things that really do work and the things that are important, that's actually an opportunity. Like all of a sudden now you're buying back. Yeah, you know, if you stop doing all of these modalities that most of which are just things for to keep you occupied while you're waiting for your body to naturally heal itself and to recover. Yeah, you know, if you no longer have to worry about that and spend time and energy on it, all of a sudden you have some extra hours in your day that you can spend doing something, you know, whatever relaxation means for you. And I want to be really clear here. I'm not opposed to all of these modalities. You know, the squeezy pants I was talking about, I would love to have a pair. I find them very relaxing, but again, it's the relaxing that's helping. You know, those, those devices were actually created for people with diabetes and other conditions where they have very poor circulation. It's really designed to help your blood flow through the extremities. Well, there's no athlete who has a problem with this. Like this isn't, you know, this isn't something that's actually helping you from that perspective. But the thing that it's doing is it's giving you an occasion and an opportunity to relax. And so I am absolutely in favor of anything that people are doing, even if it's something, you know, some kind of modality that costs money, you know, I hope that people aren't wasting money that they don't have on these things, but, you know, find something that works for you. I mean, there's a reason that I have a whole chat after in the book about placebos. Um, I actually prefer to call the placebo effect the expectation effect, because that's really what's happening here. You expect that this thing that you're doing is going to make you feel better. And in fact, that expectation actually, you know, quantitatively changes your experience of, of that thing. And so I think that that expectation effect is something that we can harness for good. It just has to be sort of done carefully. And that's why, you know, I think if you have recovery room for the team, that's great. Give the athletes an opportunity to choose and select the thing that they think is going to work for them, the thing that they like best. So it's not that this modality or the other modality is the best thing, but it's that, you know, this athlete really finds this thing relaxing. This athlete finds that this thing makes them feel better. I mean, that's part of, you know, when you ask what is recovery, I mean, it's really about feeling ready to go, right? And so anything that helps you feel rested, anything that helps you relax, that's great for recovery. And it's that aspect of it that it's helping to facilitate those feelings that really matter. Um, you know, and there's a lot of googly gawk, you know, science watching with, with the marketing of this stuff, talking about flushing lactic acid. I mean, that's all just sort of nonsensical stuff. You know, you don't need to flush lactic acid to feel better. Lactic acid isn't the thing that's making you sore. Yeah, but it sounds very scientific. It sounds very, you know, like, oh, that must be really high tech. It's got physiology and science behind it. Well, no, you know, it's using scientific terms in order to sell you something that, you know, is just another way of relaxing. Yeah. Well, that was really powerful. Ted, I've got one more question. Have you, in your talks with coaches, have they understand that they have to perform on and their ability to be rested as as important as the athletes that they coach. 
That is such a great point. It's really important. Yeah, I think that this is an underappreciated fact, right? Coaches need recovery too. And I'll just say coaching is a, an extremely taxing uh, job, particularly during competitions where you may be traveling and you know, the coach is in charge of, of facilitating all that travel and, and taking care of all the athletes. I mean, it's kind of, it's not just a 24 seven job, but during, during those competition weekends, it can be, you know, just relentless. And so it can be really hard for the coach to get enough sleep and to do all of that. And so I think it's just really important for coaches to take all of this to heart for themselves. So this recovery advice for the athletes really does apply to the coaches as well. And I think this is some place where coaches can really lead by example. You know, I talk in the book about Jenny Busick, who at the time was um, coaching, uh, you know, the Seattle women's NBA team, you know, really took sleep extremely seriously. It would go so far as to, you know, ban early morning flights and did a lot of really interesting stuff to help the team cope with um, time zone changes. But she really walked the walk. So she wasn't just telling the athletes to do it. She was doing it herself. And I think that's, that's one place where coaches can really lead by example. So not just telling the athletes to go to bed early, but go to bed early yourself too. You know, aside from your book, what other book would you recommend to our listeners? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> um, I highly recommend Dave Epstein's The Sports Gene. Um, which is all about sort of the genetics of sports. It's, it's, the title's a little misleading. There is no sports gene, singular, um, but I think it's a really nice look at one thing that we've talked about a little bit in this conversation, and that is the role of, you know, natural athletic gifts. And, you know, we talk about all these things that we do to try and improve performance, but there's this underlying thing that's really controlling a lot of it that is sort of, you know, basically choosing good pa parents, right? So that you get those good, those good sport genes. Well, I think we're going to wrap this up. Uh, Ernie, right. did you have one last comment? Well, I, I just wanted to ask one question for you, Christy, is, yeah. I mean, we covered a lot today and this was awesome. Can we expect any other works from you on this or other health and fitness topics? Yeah, sure. Well, I have been writing, I just wrote a story about pull-ups for the New York Times, which I'm still getting a lot of feedback on. I, I am a huge fan of pull-ups. Um, I have a story coming out in the Washington Post about, so this idea we were talking about, the minimum effective dose, I write about some research on weight uh, power lifters actually looking at this, that's actually finding that a minimum effective dose can be very helpful, even for highly trained uh, power athletes, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, and I am in the beginning stages of a new book, but I'm not ready to talk about it too much yet, but it's kind of along some of these lines. Nice. We'll stay tuned for uh, the release of all of those, because this is this has been an amazing conversation and, and your book is outstanding. Um, the last thing I'll say that she actually wrote on the cover, and, and maybe it, it is about happy hour, but not only did you say to train hard and then take a nap and get a good night's sleep. But in parentheses, you wrote, and maybe a beer. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm a fan of a good recovery beer, you know, only in moderation, but it can work. Yeah. That, that's awesome. Christy, where can our viewers and listeners find you on social media or yeah. anywhere? Yeah. So on social media, my handle is Crag Crest. Um, those of you that are seeing the video, that's the crag crest behind me. It's a beautiful uh, high summit there that I like to go running on. Uh, that's C-R-A-G-C-R-E-S-T. Um, you can find my website, christyashwanden.com um, or goodtogobook.com is another place where you can find out about the book and order it. And I do want to just mention, I do have the first chapter of the book is about beer and running. So if you're interested in that, yeah, it's a good place to start. Well, that's awesome. Thank you so much for your time and sharing uh, all of that great information with us. Ernie, Ted, thank you once again. Oh, Ernie, it's a pleasure. what's the puppy's name? What is the yeah, we need to know the puppy's name. Her name is Ruby. Ruby. So if, you, if you want to talk about something that can improve mood, 
<laughs> Just get yourself a puppy. <laughs> she looks very snuggly. <laughs> what about sleep? No, we'll, we'll, that's for another story. That's for another show. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank uh, you all. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Take care. Great. Thank you. All right.